Life is full of challenges, and it seems they were busier than ever. There are a lot of pressures and trials that we go through each and every day. Today's guest knows all about it, Tracy Mitchell, a conference speaker, host of the television program Life from DFW, and author of Becoming Brave, How to Think Big, Dream Wildly, and Live Fear-Free. Tracy, welcome to Bridge City News. Oh, thank you so much for hosting me. Now, Tracy, tell me a bit more about your book, Becoming Brave. Yeah, Brave was a challenge, actually. Um, I undertook uh, the writing project for Becoming Brave and never realized how brave that I was actually going to have to be. Um, when I, shortly after I contracted to write the book, I went through a series of five crises in 28 days. And so Brave is not written from a theological or expository point of view, but I wrote Brave during one of the darkest seasons of my life. And so I love that tagline, how to think big, dream wildly, and live fear-free. Most people think that if they have to live a totally fear-free life in order to have audacious dreams and to live big and to live out those um, just audacious dreams. And it's so not true. We just begin by small steps, baby steps, one day at a time in order to live that victorious life. Well, you talk about thinking big. I mean, you're in Texas, Dallas, Texas. Texas is all about thinking big, isn't it? It's a country of its own. <laughs> now, one of the statements on your website is that a victorious life is not stumbled upon, it is cultivated. Tell me more about yeah. that. Yeah, becoming brave is, most women or men don't wake up one day and decide, hey, today I wanna be brave. But it's people who are pushed in positions that they have no choice to become brave. And so what do you do when, when, the, when the cards are stacked against you, when life is not dealing the best hand? And then we just choose incrementally, today I'm going to, to get out of that bed of depression, or today I'm going to think in a different way than what I thought yesterday. And so we line out in Becoming Brave, how baby steps towards becoming brave, baby steps be to becoming uh, courageous, reprogramming their mind, rethinking it, just Mark starts with that tiny, small step in the right direction. Now, you say when we run into the trials of life, it often really reveals who we are. Is that a good thing? Um, sometimes. Uh, the, the, the matter of the fact is that it's revealing. And what we do with the knowledge that we gain during those dark seasons uh, determines what becomes of our life. You know, we fall into that bit of discouragement and stay there, or we find a way to climb out and to do things that we never even imagined were possible. I think we all battle with fear and insecurity to varying degrees. Can you share some of your own personal struggles in this area? Also maybe offer some advice to help others to rise above? Absolutely. Uh, my life didn't begin as a, as a fairy tale at all. And in my first book, Downside Up, Embracing Rejection as Life's Golden Opportunity, I share that my personal insecurity, my struggle was feeling that I had my life had no merit or no worth. And so I unpacked that thought. How do we turn something as severe as betrayal or rejection to our advantage? How do we flip the cards on that? And so I line out the top 10 reasons of how to embrace rejection um, as a golden opportunity in life. Because the truth is we can't avoid rejection. We can't hide from it. We can't intellectualize beyond it. So what do we do when we face things like rejection or things like betrayal is we have to have a game plan in place before and then begin to act and, and see that it's our best friend and personal conductor through life. Now, becoming a brave person does not necessarily mean that fear will not be present in our lives, correct? Absolutely. No, it's not if fear won't be there, but what do we do with it? When we discover things like, um, I had a fear of public speaking, and now I make my living. My calling is to speak before uh, millions at a time and to travel the world. But when I look back at my life, that's the very thing that the enemy on my soul did not, didn't want me to do. Wanted me to feel so inferior, so beat down, so insecure that I would never open my mouth. And so again, we have to face those fears, not only face them, but learn to conquer them, rise above them, and find a way to work those things to our advantage. Now, many of us live in a pressure cooker. We try to live up to the expectations of those around us, including a lot of friends and family. Culture can define our role in life. So any thoughts on how to really deal with this? Yeah, I don't let culture define, and I teach women in particular, how um, if we were dependent on culture to shift and to develop 
who we're becoming, then that would change with every decade because culture has a different viewpoint based on the decade that we're living in, based on the country that we're living in. You know, I was just in Cuba uh, a matter of months ago, and I spoke before leaders of that nation for seven days. And one of the primary things that I did was speak to that very um, thought and create that shift in their minds. How do we awake from what society is telling us that we can or can't do or what we should or should not become? Now, we all long to measure up, to be affirmed, to be loved and valued. What do you say to someone who does not have that support and those people around him or her to do that? You know, I, I would look carefully. Um, sometimes the most unsuspecting places are people you will find that sense of worth or validation. Um, in particular, if you're a believer, I pray. I ask God to uncover those who um, would have a word for my life, who could affirm and reaffirm and bring wisdom to my life. And so through prayer, number one, discovering who they are, being attentive, being aware, and not focusing on the negative people of opinion around you. If our life gets caught up in what the negativity, what people say around us, we will never discover those who actually have a positive voice. You know, I've had to do that myself, cut some of the toxic and negative people out of my life. And it, it's hard, especially if you've known these people for 10 or 15 years, but if they constantly bring you down, that's hard. You need to have more support today. Now, you write about the feminist movement that can at times make women, instead of brave, more brash and angry. Can you give me some examples of that? Absolutely. In our culture, they have, uh, have sold us the lie, culture has, that in order to be brave, you have to come off as brash. And I found that that's the total reverse of what scripture reveals to us, that women can be meek. They can be comforting and confrontational all at the same time. Um, we don't have to be weak. We weren't wired weak, but we don't have to be abrasive and brash in our opinions. And so how do we do that? How do we find that delicate balance? And again, becoming brave unearths that. It shows strong women who are strong in their faith, but they have wisdom that's applied to the bravery that they discovered. Do you think sometimes people have a tough time, Tracy, agreeing to disagree? Absolutely. You know, it, it, it takes moxie and a lot of wisdom. Uh, the Bible says that a soft answer, what, turns away wrath. And so having the wisdom to know what to say in the moment. Um, I'm friends with a ton of people on my Twitter feed that I have absolutely no points of commonality with them at all. Not socio, not politic, not political, not religion. And agreeing to disagree for the greater good. I like voices of different schools of thought, of different paths, because something in their journey, they know something based on their journey that I've yet to discover. So we, we live in a culture where we will, we will bump heads, we will bump theologically um, in just our day-to-day -day interaction. So learning how to do that in a Christian-like manner. You know, how do we do that? How do we hold our own, but yet be kind and be wise in our, in our interactions? A lot of people today struggle with shame. So what advice do you have for women who wrestle with that emotion? Yeah, we're living in a season where we can't wrap ourselves in sheets of shame. My mind immediately goes back to the very assignment against the first woman was to lock her in so much shame that she never birthed anything again. And I think that's so powerful is that we have to understand that shame doesn't limit what God can or cannot do with us. It doesn't limit what culture can or cannot do with us. I love that picture. Uh, most people leave Eve alone in the garden with her head hung in shame because she took the full brunt, the blame for all of fallen humanity. And for the life of me, I can't imagine what that level of shame must have felt like. But God looked at her in that garden in her sheets of shame. And he told her, he said, yes, why you are shame build. He said, I promise you that the seed of all of hope, of all of humanity will come through your womb. And today, God's the same way. He measures the same level of grace to every woman, to every man who may found, find themselves wrapped in sheets of shame. He wants to unwrap you, to cloak you in grace, and to let you know that your shame does, does not discredit you from the future that he has for you. Now, your book touches on pursuing our dreams. Sometimes it's easy to lose sight of those dreams. What kinds of things are dream killers? I think betrayal is the number one dream killer of all. If you've ever been through 
any form of betrayal, especially through someone that uh, you've been in close relationship with, the enemy seeks through close relationships, again, to uh, disconnect us from our dreams from, from betrayal. Number one tactic of the adversary, whether we betrayed ourselves or someone else betrays us. And we have to learn, again, how do we handle the difficult things like betrayal? Will that help us eradicate all of our dreams? Or will we use like Jesus, he used betrayal as a catalyst to help him fulfill his assignment in the earth. Is the fear of failure often a dream killer as well? It is, you know, if, if you don't have a slight bit of natural fear, not God-given fear, but just natural fear, I'm not so sure that what you're doing is actually part of the plan that God has for your life. And so it's learning again how to shape fear. It's not that fear is a sin in itself, but what do we do with fear? How do we cultivate it? Do we let it capsize what we're doing or do we, we, we cultivate that thing to be a stepping stone to our future? Should people be more intentional about achieving their dreams? Maybe take a piece of paper and actually physically write down a plan and maybe get an accountability partner at the same time? I think that's huge. Um, you know, as someone challenged me years ago, they asked me what I needed for, for the next season of my dream. And I said, oh, just pray for me. You know, just think of me. And they turned around and walked away and said, okay, we'll do that. And then the next year, I got me a dream book. I did exactly what you said. I had me a dream book. And I had outlined in that every way that the next time someone said, hey, how can I help? How can I be a partner? How can I join in with what you're doing? Is I had an entry level for everyone who wanted to help. And all of a sudden, I saw by handing them that dream book that I had more partners than I could count, more people who were on board with what we were doing than I could ever imagine, simply because I had a plan of action. Now, you believe that God has biologically wired women as networkers and communicators. Why do you think that is? Uh, if you go back and you look at, you, I like to go back to the Bible and to see what God said about someone first. And so when you trace back the Hebrew word, the word is Ezer, E-C-E-R, what he named womankind. And that word has been translated to be helper, but it, it's really a four-part word, meaning brave, strong, courageous, redeemer, and savior. And so by tracing the roots back, and the only other time that God used that Hebrew word was when he called himself the same word 14 times in scripture. So when we look at that, God said about women, he said, you're brave, you're a form of a savior, you're a redeemer, and you're hope to humanity. And if God says that about ourselves, then why should we settle for any lesser labeling of what society may call us? Now, Tracy, reality is each of us will have some storms in life, and you say we need to learn how to embrace those storms? Yeah. I was sailing. I love the water not long ago, and I was taking a, a non power boat sail, so a wind sail. And I was taking a class and the storm waves began to capsize our little boat. And I leaned over and I asked the, the sailor, I said, what do we do in a situation like this? And I'll never forget it. He said, Tracy, if you'll just learn to lean into the storm. He said, the storm will take you beyond what you're in right now. And I thought about that. You know what, if we would just learn to lean in, there are some storms we can't outrun, some storms we can't evade, some storms we can't hide from. But if we can learn to lean into the storm, the storm will eventually pass. How much more of a challenge do you think it is for people who don't know Christ, don't know how that relationship with God, to navigate through those storms in life? I think it's it's very hard. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's very difficult because the one thing that is the anchor um, in our world and the anchor in the middle of those storms is our identity and who we're created to be. And in all cultures right now, we see such a shift, such a loss of core identity, uh, gender can be all kind of confusion at, that are core rooted in our identity. And so rediscovering those, working those to our advantage and um, finding those things out. What advice would you give for husbands to be able to support their wives who are going through storms in their lives right now? Yeah, lean in and listen. Lean in and slowly listen. Women will tell you what you need to know. Um, they don't want men who are necessarily problem solvers. They want a good listener. Women can usually work out their issues by simply talking and communicating because that's how we're wired. And it's not that we want to talk for men to solve our problems. We want men to have an affinity with what we're actually saying. And you know what's interesting as a man myself, I've talked to other husbands and say, 
We want to help. We want to be able to solve those problems. And my wife says, I don't want it solved. Like you said, I just want you to listen. Yes. Thank you so much, Tracy. Tracy Mitchell, author of Becoming Brave. Appreciate your time and joining us today from Dallas, Texas. Thank you. And behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless. Have a great night.